the global black caucus sorry <laughs> that popped up um that's all right um the global black caucus and the pa state team are co-hosting tonight's event together with da uk and da germany we're thrilled to be able to welcome our two guests for tonight's q a session filmmaker tim harris and state representative malcolm Caniato. I'm pleased to introduce you to Tim Harris, director and co-producer of Kenyatta, Do Not Wait Your Turn. Tim is executive producer and director of Seven Knots Film and Media, a company he founded in 2014. Tim is motivated to move audiences to think, feel, and act in a new way by telling heartfelt and visually compelling stories. In addition to his work with this film, Tim is also the director of multiple award-winning and feature short films. Through his company, he has worked on promotions with other leading political figures such as Governor, excuse me, such as former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords and Senator Mark Kelly. Tim is based in his home city of Philadelphia. Hey, everyone. <laughs> And I'm, I'm Jesse. I am the lead for the PA State team. We're co-hosting tonight's event together with the Global Black Caucus. Uh, and I probably don't need to introduce our other panelists, since you did just see the film about him, but I'll go ahead and do that anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm is joining us today. He is a proud North Philadelphia native, representing the state's 181st House District. He was first elected in 2018 at the age of just 28. And he became Pennsylvania's first openly LGBTQ person of color ever elected to the PA Assembly. He means since become a statewide leader and a strong advocate for the reproductive rights of women, common sense, gun safety policies, clean energy, and uh, public education, and many, many more topics. And since his Senate run in 2022, he's continued to have an impact in PA and on the national stage. Earlier this year, he was named by President Biden as chair of the Presidential Advisory Commission on advancing educational equity, excellence, and economic opportunity for Black Americans. And he also, earlier this year, launched his statewide campaign for Auditor General. So we are, are very excited to be able to turn it over to our two panelists now. Tim, uh, we'll have you say a few words, and then you, Malcolm. Oh, sure. So uh, yeah, first of all, thank you all for coming and watching the film. Um, it means a lot. It's really amazing that our premiere was in London and that this film is reaching, you know, an international audience, but it's especially, you know, nice to to have a bunch of American citizens watch the film um, from afar and, and see sort of what's been happening um, over here in the States. And, you know, this is a really meaningful experience to to be out here promoting this film and having people watch it and, and respond to it. And obviously, you know, so many of the topics covered in the film are things that have been going on for years and, you know, will probably continue to go on in the future. And so it, it just means a lot to, to have people watch it and respond to it in such a amazing way. And so I'm excited to answer your questions and, and thank you again for having us. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, if you like the film, I'm Malcolm Kenyatta. If you didn't like the film, I just look like him and I don't know him really at all. Um, but, but genuinely, um, I just want to thank you all for doing this and, um, you know, forever grateful to, to, to Tim um, for, for, for taking this on and, and telling, and telling the story. Uh, I am still so, so humbled by all the folks who got involved in our race, who have reached out after seeing this film, who say to me, you know, separate and apart from my particular story, but that they feel inspired to get involved in their own way, in their own community, whatever that looks like. And I really do hope that that's one of the key takeaways um, that you have after watching it, um, that power is a lot more diffuse than we think it is, um, that all of us have the opportunity to um, engage. And when we do, there's a real payoff to, to, to that engagement. You know, Jesse mentioned I am running for Auditor General, which is one of the four statewide constitutional offices in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and I'll tell you, much different race this time. Um, there are a lot of folks who said, hey, I wasn't with you last time, but boy, but boy maybe I should have been. Um, and so we're walking into this race, um, just to add some context, um, with the endorsement of every member of Congress, with over half of all the uh, county Democratic Party chairs, 75% of my House colleagues, and to date, nobody's 
even announce running against me. Senator Casey was our auditor general before he became our senator. And so, you know, I'm excited to be in this role and, you know, grateful, frankly, for the opportunity to have people learn about me and my story through the film and through the campaign um, and to hopefully, fingers crossed, us, uh, have an opportunity to uh, to serve statewide in our incredible Commonwealth, um, and I really look forward to to your questions. Great, thank you very much. And we actually have our first question here from London for you, Malcolm, uh, from one of the the viewers there. Seeing how well you can do in your campaign with the small amount of money you had compared with the other candidates, what did you learn to apply for your next campaign for your Auditor General campaign? Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I think um, a part of what I find so 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 dangerous, because let me be very clear, um, I do think that too often we can be reflexively partisan. And so when I talk about the Republican Party, I hope folks recognize not being reflexively partisan. I just hate them because they're Republicans, right? Um, but I do think in this moment, a part of what so many elected Republican leaders want to do is to make us be afraid of one another, um, to encourage us to engage in this zero sum um, game. And I think a part of what I took from this campaign more than anything else is that people are a lot better than I think we give each other credit for. And the reality is, I think one of the big lies that hampered our campaign this time that we've been able to flip on its head, um, especially I think after folks have watched the, the, the film, is this idea that, oh my gosh, there are folks in the state who will never be for me, you know, simply because I'm black and simply because I'm from Philadelphia and, you know, those people are awful. Um, I think that that's nonsense. I believe it was nonsense in my race. I think there are a bunch of reasons um, why John, you know, won having a lot of money obviously was a, was a big part of it because there are a lot of people who just never got to meet us. And so after the campaign ended to now, there are a lot of people who got to meet us. I mean, Tim uh, showed it in the film, but we traveled all around the Commonwealth campaigning for John. Um, and what ended up happening is a lot of people who maybe had ears closed to me um, after the primary were more willing to, to, to listen. And that unfortunately happens to candidates of color, to women when they run. People will listen more when you're in a support role than when you're saying, hey, I want to run and be in this position. Um, but what has happened is that a lot of those folks who chose to listen to me because I was now in that support role um, have recognized that, hey, actually, um, I have a lot to offer in my own right, that a lot of folks who come from backgrounds like me have a lot to offer in my, in my own right. And so the big takeaway I have is to ignore a lot of the punditry and noise, and ignore the messages that suggest we should d divide ourselves up and that um, we can't build the type of coalition that drives sustainable change. And that coalition has to involve a lot of people. It has to be people of color, people of conscience, folks in the LGBTQ community, people who are straight and allies. It's going to require all of us. And there are a lot of people across Pennsylvania um, who want to be who want to be a part of that. And I'm, you know, very excited, um, as I said in the lead up, about where we are um, in this campaign and um, about the success that we are going to have um, in this next race. I'm literally in the car because I'm leaving D.C. for CBC Weekend, going to York County to be the keynote speaker at the York uh, County Dems um, dinner. And we were in Washington County last week, uh, excuse me, yes, last night, um, I'm also the keynote speaker at their at their county dinner. So so we're, we're, we're working, drinking water, minding our business, and working hard. <laughs> Yes, you are a hard worker. I don't know how you do it, but we're grateful that you're doing and you're putting yourself out there. And actually, this question ties into what you were just uh, responding to. It's a question from Frankfurt. And the question is, what was one of the major things that allowed you to connect and appeal to voters across all demographics? So this, I will answer the question you didn't ask. Yes, I will come to Frankfurt. You tell me when to be there. I'll be right there. I can't wait. Um, but additionally, um, you know, honestly, I, I refuse to be somebody I'm, I'm not. Um, I 100% refuse. Um, when I ran for, for state rep and Tim 
um, is connected to this story tangentially, but, but Tim, uh, I really badgered him into doing the launch video, um, for my first race for, for, for state rep, um, and in the and in the video, you know, short little intro launch video, um, I just mentioned that I was gay. It was not central to my campaign, you know. And I, and frankly, to be honest, it was not even something I even recognized. I said, um, you know, I said I'm a poor black gay kid from North Philly. It's just, you know, whatever. We moved on. And somebody who was a supporter of mine, supporter of mine, said, "Oh, you know, that's a that's a great video, but you're gonna like take out the part where you say you're like gay, right?" I was like, no, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on it. And they're like, well, you're going to lose. Point blank. They're like, you're going to lose. There's no way, you know, in, in my district where we have the, in Pennsylvania, one of the highest concentrations of, you know, Baptist churches and, you know, huge faith community, um, you know, oh, there's, there's, there's no way you're going to win. And the fact that you refuse to take it out just shows that, that you, you know, you're not teachable. I think they said, um, and, you know, I had a a moment of internal crisis around that, honestly, because this was somebody who I, you know, was supporting me, and I wanted to hear their feedback, not in the frankly, effectively homophobic frame that they were using. I wanted to try to hear it beyond that, and I was really concerned. But I I said to to myself and to my now husband, I'm gonna win or lose as myself. I don't think I owe even if somebody wants to serve the public, I don't owe bending myself into a pretzel um, to try to be something I'm not. Um, and also, if I lack that authenticity, then I have to then spend two years reintroducing people to who, who I actually am because I spent an entire campaign lying about who I am. I fundamentally refuse to do it. And I think that is actually the most powerful thing that we can each do is to just be ourselves. And I don't know when that stops because all of us, if there's a kid in this room right now, we'd say to them, be whoever you are. You'll be great. You know, you're going to be whatever you want to be. But at some age, we stop meaning it when we say that. Um, I refuse to stop meaning, meaning it. I'm going to be who I am. And I think my lived experience and who I am um, I think that I can be an added benefit to our governmental process. And, you know, if there's a job that I think I can do a good job in um, and it makes sense for me and my family. I'm going to run and I'm going to run as Malcolm and I'll win or lose as, as Malcolm. And I'm comfortable with that. Great. Thank you so much for that, Malcolm. And our next question is actually for Tim uh, from the PA state team. Tim. This film has really been described as, as a love letter to Philly and as, as someone who has lived in Philly, and I'm sure for our audience members who have lived in Philly, you really feel that. You feel that spirit and that soul of the city. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you really work to capture that, that the struggles and that spirit of Philadelphia and what you learned about the city in the process? Uh, sure, yeah, I love that question. And I think, you know, when Malcolm first watched the film, I, I was obviously really nervous about what he would think because he spent all this time with us and we spent all this time with him like the worst thing would be if he absolutely hated it um and one of the first things he said to me was i really think you captured my neighborhood you know really really well and as a document as a documentary filmmaker like that's that's what you want to hear you don't want to hear that you put your own spin on something you want to hear that you captured something as true as you could with with a camera crew walking around and and filming. Um, and so, you know, Philadelphia is is talked about a lot in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I feel like you you hear about it a lot, especially through sports and how rough the fans are and how tough the city is and all this stuff. But, you know, the things you don't see or hear as much is like that the passion comes from from this deep place of love and it's love of each other, love of community and and wanting the city to get better as a, as a place. Um, and so, you know, in the film, Malcolm talks about, you know, all the things that he went through growing up and, and all the challenges that the area faced. Um, but I think what screams off the screen is like the amazing uh, joy too, that, that exists there in the people that live there and, and the vibrancy of this amazing community. And so that was really important um for me to show because 
I think number one, it's the side of Philly you don't get to see often. But number two, I think that joy informs, you know, who Malcolm is in a way um, and kind of this endless optimism and positivity that he exudes. You know, you would think (laughs) given all that he's gone through that, you know, he could have plenty of reasons to be very negative and and very cynical. Um, But there's all these people that he's grown up with that have helped raise him that uh you know are just endlessly um endlessly joyous and so i think i think that's what we were able to capture um and that you know poverty doesn't always equal like you know people who are depressed all the time <laughs> like there's 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 still full people with with lots of uh dimension to them and so um yeah it, it was it was a joy to to film in philly i lived i went to temple university so i lived in that neighborhood for for you know a couple years um and that's where malcolm and i met as well and so i saw it every day too you know i would come home from school for christmas break or whatever and everyone would be like oh how's how's temple <laughs> and i'd be like oh, it's great i don't know my neighbors who are not college students are, are really nice and um you know they're college kids who are going to mess all that up and have perceptions about them out there. But overall, I, I think I captured the North Philly I saw when I lived there as well. Great. Thank you. I might, I agree. I think you, I have a lot of friends from Philly, so I think you captured Philly very, North Philly very well. Um, I have a question now from Antar Keith, who's the chair of Democrats Abroad Reparations Task Force, and he's in Germany. And his question is, oops, sorry. His question is, uh, considering that Fetterman pulled a gun on a black man while maintaining a high, sorry, I'm struggling with, a high poll number, shows that such actions did not prove a deal breaker with a vast amount of of the Pennsylvania electorate. One thing that your grandfather, Mohammed Kenyatta, advocated was reparations for the accumulated damage inflicted on Black Americans for past eras as federal policies. Do you believe that such, uh, sorry, do you believe that, that such a refusal of wealth gap and imbue Black lives with humanity and society. Finally, would you support efforts? Sorry. I'm sorry, I think this I... is a long question. I can't see it very well. It's a very long question. Sorry. Uh, um, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, say, um, your, your grandfather, Mohammed Kenyatta, advocated for reparations that accumulated damage affected on it. Um, Black Americans for past era and federal policies. Do you believe that such such solution would finally close the refusal, the wealth gap, and imbue Black Americans with? Uh... I'm sorry. Really no, it's fine. It's fine, Adrian. Adrian, Adrian, Adrian it's okay. I'll, I'll jump in. I think. Okay. I think I got. Yeah, I please. Got thank you. I think you get the the gist of it. It's yeah, I got, a really I got long the question, gist. So it's very hard to see. <laughs> no, I got, I got the gist. And, and thank and thank and thank you for the for, for the question. Um, and sorry, I can't see you. Uh, you know what I would say mm-hmm. is that you know you have a number of you know states, municipalities, and even at the the federal level, folks who are who, who are looking into how you how you would do. Uh, such a thing, and I think that that's noble and worthy goal. Um, and we're going to see, see that continue. What I would say more broadly is, I don't think there's a single panacea to closing the the, the racial wealth gap, and I don't believe um, that 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 would close the the racial um, wealth gap in and of itself. A part of what we're going to have to do, in my opinion, um, is to, I think there are really two big channels in which um, we see generated family wealth, right? Um, one, and I was just talking to somebody about this, and I'm going to steal some of the best things she she said. Um, Kelly, who's the founder of BIA, uh, folks should go look at the Black Innovation Alliance, um, an incredible thought leader. And she said something that really resonated with me that I'll really repeat and associate myself with her comments. Um, that there are really two major ways in America that you uh, gain wealth. 
A through uh, through through folks who get money, they inherit money, right, from their from their family, inherit money, property, other things. For a lot of African Americans, that does not exist. We know why, and we know that the ideology, frankly, that allowed for hundreds of years for the black uh, enslavement of, of of black folks in this country, we know that. Tragically, that ideology has not gone away. Actually, in many quarters, it has found a home and renewed life. And so that's that's dangerous. That's on the horizon. We have to we have to deal with that. But but the first bucket is the generational wealth. The second bucket is really entrepreneurship. And when Jesse introduced me and mentioned that I'm serving on as the chair, I believe the youngest person, the chair of Presidential Advisory Commission in American History um, on advancing educational equity, economic opportunity for Black Americans. A part of what we have to look at is how do we create more opportunities for folks to be entrepreneurs in a real way? And what do we do to break down the barriers to access to capital, to access to qualified talent, to the ability to scale up their businesses? How do we deal with some of those challenges? Because as important as I think it is that we raise the minimum wage, for example, you're not going to minimum wage yourself to generational wealth. As important as it is to deal with the ongoing legacy and, frankly, the current implementation of redlining, implicit and explicit, even dealing with that and increasing Black home ownership. You're not going to home own your way out of deep generational injustice. What we have to do is create more opportunities for Black folks to be truly economically empowered, and that means to be their own boss, to move um, African Americans in this country from almost solely being consumers to actually being producers of, of, of things. And the, and the issue is not that Black folks aren't producing the culture, the ideas, the innovations. The issue is that we don't often own them. And as I like to say, there are a lot of folks who love our rhythm and not our blues. And there are a lot of people who own our stuff and want to give us pennies on the dollars of something that was our idea in the first place. <laughs> and so, you know, as I look at this, I want to look at, how we create a whole host and a whole generation of Black entrepreneurs in a variety of different sectors outside of the, the, the service sector where we so often see banks and others saying, okay, well, if you want to open a barbershop, maybe we'll do that. But we're not trying to help you um, scale up a financial services firm, for example. Until we shift some of those things, we're going to see the generational, the wealth gap continue to widen. And I think that we have an opportunity to close it. And I'm going to do certainly everything in my power um, to do it. Thank you, Malcolm. Thanks for taking that important topic and one that's been very, very much resonating with Americans since this electoral cycle and, and in the past one as well. Uh, Tim, this next question is for you. So when you when did you decide to film the campaign specifically for your documentary? When did you decide to focus on uh, the campaign and how was it paid for? That's coming from a viewer <laughs> in London. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. The second part is it wasn't paid for. <laughs> um, this was very much a labor of love from obviously myself, but a lot of other people that that know me and came to know Malcolm and, and Dr. Matt and fell in love with the story and knew it was an important story to tell. Um, and, you know, we, we got some funding for post-production, but through production, it was largely just, you know, a bunch of people who, who wanted to tell this story. Um, when lose a draw for Malcolm, it wasn't about that. It was about, you know, these incredible people that we were following on this journey. And so, um, I don't want to do it like that again, <laughs> necessarily, but uh, this one, I feel like will always hold a special place in my heart just because it was so pure that way. Like there wasn't, there wasn't an outside influence telling us what to do. We could really kind of do it however we wanted. And, and we got to do that. Um, in terms of how we started the project, uh, I had made a short film that Malcolm alluded to in 2018 um, during his first run for state rep called Going Forward. You can watch that on YouTube, just search going forward, Malcolm Kenyatta, it'll come up. Um, it was, it was on the Atlantic. Um, 
And so we had met several years before that at Temple University, and we've just always sort of kept in contact. And um, maybe two or three years later, I guess, after the the short came out, I approached Malcolm about maybe doing, you know, following him on election day every every year for 10 years and doing sort of a boyhood documentary about a politician, um, which I still think would be a cool idea. But then he told me he was running for Senate. And I was like, well, you know, let's this- do it, Tim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, we still could do it. Um, but he told me he was running for Senate. And obviously, I knew the historical uh, ramifications of that. And um, I knew who I had an idea who the competition would be at the time. And so I thought it would be a really compelling story to to follow. And I say this a lot, but um, at the beginning and at Malcolm, I, I think I don't think he would have gotten into this if he didn't believe this. But I thought this was, you know, I thought he was going to win. And I thought this was going to be, you know, following this person who I, I really respect, but also like, you know, he's a shooting star that he's going to be everywhere after this. And I still think he is a shooting star for the record, but I didn't imagine at all it would go in the direction it did. And part of that, I think, is like sort of my, you know, my blindness to um, obviously I'm I'm a white man. I don't have to deal with a lot of the racial implications that Malcolm had to deal with. I don't know the fundraising um, the fundraising world of politics as well. Um, and so it was kind of an eye opening moment for me. And as someone who follows politics, I think more than the average American, for me to be sort of blindsided by that, I was like, you know, I, I knew immediately that a lot of people were going to learn a lot about the system from this movie. Um, and so that's sort of what kept the kept the the train moving as things were developing. And it was clear, you know, about the the factors at play that were out of Malcolm's control, um, that sort of became the the story. But the the main heartbeat of the story was always the char- the characters and the per- participants in the film, Malcolm and Dr. Matt, um, just being amazing people and incredibly charismatic, incredibly introspective. And to Malcolm's point about being himself, you know, that's that's the reason I did this because I knew he wasn't. There was no veil over over the process like some days he was mad we were there some days he was happy we were there like we were getting the real (laughs) the real malcolm the whole time um and dr matt's participation um you know just took it to a whole nother level and i think you you all have probably seen a number of political films you know through this program um but i think what makes this one different is you've never seen a, a duo like malcolm and dr matt um in politics really before a a a openly gay black couple going through a a really scrutinized election um and seeing them getting married during the whole process that was that was sort of the thing that i knew we had something really special as soon as dr matt and malcolm were pitching me to film their wedding i was like okay this is gonna be a good movie Yeah, that's great. Those are great answers. And um, Tim, I think I can, I'm looking at your faces now and I can see the friendship that's there between the two of you all. And so it comes through on the film as well. So this is, that was a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, And I hope you carry on with the project that that you just described as well. So now I have a question um, that's two questions, actually one from Germany and the UK. So the first one is, what is it going to take for these elections not to be about who has the most money? This is from Malcolm. Um, the second question is also from Malcolm. And as financial barriers are so prominent in the process of campaigning, in which ways is your campaign overcoming this struggle right now? So how do you how do you fight against this in your current campaign? So I don't I don't know. Being honest, I don't know that this is a problem we ever solve. Um, I don't believe that you have to raise the most money to win. And I think you can, I think politics is replete with examples of folks who got outraised and outspent by significant amounts of money and 
the person with the least money won. And so, um, you know, something Tim said, I would just underscore, um, this was not, you know, a vanity run. It was not a, you know, I have people say to me, oh, are you ran so you could now run for Auditor General? I did not fucking do all that to run for Auditor General. I promise you that. Um, I would have just run for Auditor General. Um, but I do think that a part of what can shift this is going to be what we're all hoping happens is that the media takes a very hard look in the mirror. And that's difficult for, I think, folks in the media to do, um, particularly as media is, as local media goes away, um, by and large, we're seeing the real hollowing out of local media, meaning the stories that we tell are less from the vantage point of people who live in community. And the incentives, the economic incentives, which were always there in newspapers, everybody wanted to sell their paper at the end of the day, those incentives have been, uh, I think, really pronounced, particularly as we see more media companies um, being, bought, being bought up by private equity and folks who want to come in and, you know, really just turn a profit, you know, stories be damned, impact be damned. That is damaging to our country. It's, it's deeply damaging. You know, the fact that I will still to this day meet reporters who now in this race say, oh my gosh, uh, I really wish I had, you know, covered you in the, in the, in the Senate race, you know, but, but my, but my editor wouldn't let me. Um, you saw a reporter in the, in the story say that, you know, she bumped up against that with her editor who said, well, you can write something nice about them when it's over. And so we, we did not get the ability for folks to authentically engage with the ideas, the platforms, the personalities, the experiences of, of the candidates. And if you are not somebody like me, who's going county to county to county, as I do all the time, engaging with people, meeting with people, really in the inside baseball, how do you engage with politics, right? You read an article about what's happening in politics. That's how you know what's happening. That's how you engage with it. And so when the folks who are supposed to be umpires of truth are more worried about ratings, that is a perverse incentive. And it's gonna always skew them toward overcovering people who are going to ultimately put ads in their paper, throw up, you know, put commercials on their airwaves, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I think I think that that's a part of I think that that's a big part of the challenge. But I will tell you the, the the final thing that just came to me as I'm talking is the more that folks step up to run, the novelty of this goes away in a, in a positive way. Um, you know, I, I think about from that race to now, when you look at the the support that we've earned in uh, throughout this race. When I look at the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Senator Street, who was not in the in the documentary, um, but after the documentary was over, the first African-American to lead the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. Um, we have a woman right now, Tamika Lane, if you're in Pennsylvania, mail in your ballot for Tamika Lane, um, who could be only the second African-American woman on one of our appellate courts, the Superior Court, the busiest appellate, appellate court um, in, in America. The more candidates run, the less folks are like shocked by, you know, a black person is running or a gay person is running. I mean, after Tim's film, I mean, in that in that cycle, we are now have five openly LGBTQ members of the state house. When Tim was doing that film, I was the only one. Now it's five of us. And three of the members have said to me directly, they ran because they saw me run for office. That not only you know, makes me feel good, but it deepens the bench and expands the type of representation that people get in their communities. And when that happens, the stories have to change. You know, it, it just has to change. Um, I think it's going to be a grueling process, um, but over time, um, it will it will shift. And that's the reality for most of the systemic issues that we see, racism, sexism, homophobia. Um, we take a couple of steps forward. We take 90 steps backwards and we keep going in this, you know, really often perverse, you know, cha-cha dance that we do 
um, to get to a place where everybody is treated with respect and dignity and judged based on, you know, the policy platform that they lay out and not some of these, um, you know, metrics that, uh, that benefit the well-off and well-connected. Thank you so much, Malcolm, for talking about that topic of, of um, broadening representation among our elected officials. A great time to remind all of our PA audience members that ballots are out. So uh, please go ahead and get those ballots sent back in for the 2023 judicial and municipal elections. And I have another question for Malcolm. Given that the PA General Assembly has been dominated by the Republicans, how is the change in the House, how is that major of voice heard effectively coming from a viewer in London? It has been pronounced, and I will tell you, I've, uh, I've I've had my microphone cut off now zero times, so that's pretty good. Um, and we're in a position where you know many of my house colleagues are really are really struggling. I think that next year um, we're going to expand um, our majority from just one singular vote uh, to I think possibly we'll have a five to seven seat majority in the house. Um, my Republican colleagues, many of them have not been able to survive at this point where we had nine months in the minority, um, you know, and, you know, I don't, uh, my heart does not break for them. I have no tears uh, for them, um, but they're finding it very difficult. And what that's going to mean from an electoral perspective is that you're going to see a lot of retirements. Um, I think you're going to see a lot. And that opens up the opportunity for Democrats in 50-50 tough districts because the incumbency, you know, whether you're good at your job or bad at your job, the incumbency certainly does um, have its electoral benefits. And when I think about some of the folks who we beat barely, like there was a district we lost in Bucks County by 36 votes. Um, and actually, I think this is always think this is a funny story, but actually we thought we had won this seat and literally, Trump talks about the ballots found like under the table or something. Literally, ballots were found after, but Democrats didn't try to burn down the, the Capitol um, after that happened. We accepted that, you know, we should count every vote. And in this instance, our candidate lost by 36 votes. But when you lose a race by 36 votes, that lets you know um, there's a real opportunity for, for, you, for you to win. And so the person in that race, for example, Frank Ferry, I don't think he, he, he runs again. Um, and I think that my colleagues have found it very difficult looking up at the dais and seeing a Black woman leading our chamber. The racism and the sexism that has come from the floor, particularly from the former speaker, um, has been profound. It's been incredibly um, pronounced, but I think uh, Speaker McClinton has uh, comported herself well. And I was really honored to get to nominate her um, to lead our chamber and to play a small role in this historic moment. And so I'm excited about where we are. We have done a lot of great things, universal breakfast, um, you know, the largest investment in public education and the history of the Commonwealth funding indigent defense. We're the only state in the nation that not fund indigent defense on and on and on. And so we've we've gotten a lot done. We've really moved the needle. And I think because of um, Tim and others who have been willing to tell these stories, it's helped to lower the barrier in terms of people thinking they can run and they can win. I mean, I, I really am, I guess I shouldn't be shocked, but still so inspired by folks who are running for state rep who, you know, saw one of the film festivals where they could watch it virtually and saw the film and are, and are inspired. And that's really the power of storytelling and the stories that we tell. And so Tim and the Seven Knots team who took this on, um, I give them a little bit of credit as well for helping us to flip the house and for inspiring some folks who are going to run this cycle, who are going to help us expand that majority. Yeah, that's a great answer, Malcolm. And I, I think um, one of the key things you just said is um, also the impact of the stories and that what, so Tim's filmmaking is instrumental to this. Also, you being ready and Matt also, who's a wonderful person. We're missing him tonight. Please give him our regards. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, this it's important what you're doing and what you all are saying. This work and this film shows, it really brings it across that one, each one of our votes really counts. 
right? And so we have to vote every single time because if you're winning by 36 votes or something like that, we are making a difference and you just have to keep going at it. So thank you for that answer. Um, I have another question for you now, which is from, again, people in Frankfurt. This is from, from Malcolm as well. And um, the question is from Jonathan. He wants to know, do you think Obama faced the same setbacks regarding the impression of his unelectability? And if so, is there any way, anything we can learn from how he overcame them? I mean, of, of course he did. <laughs> of course he did. I mean, that was one of the premier arguments against him. But it's also, you know, it's also the power of winning elections. You know, when you win, people act like your win was uh, foretold. And that's what we've done, unfortunately, with uh, folks like uh, President Obama, is pretend as if um, everything was smooth selling. Of course, he was going to win, and, and it all just, just worked out. And that's why this, this story, and I'll uh, turn it over to Tim, uh, but that's why this story is so important. In the, and, and it's why we wanted to you know, be as open as we could with Tim to tell the story, because when we do win statewide election next year, with hopefully some of your your helps, if you're PA voters, um, when we do go on to win a United States Senate seat at some point, you don't have to ask. There's a Senate seat. Yes, I'm running. Somebody run, <laughs> retires, I'll be running again. Don't worry about it. Um, when that happens, there are going to be a lot of people who act like, oh, well, of course that happened. No, it's not, of course. It requires a steely disposition and a willingness to ignore the naysayers and just get up there and do it. And when the story of my career is told, when I'm no longer in, in politics, um, I don't want people to ever believe it was, it was smooth sailing um, or that those barriers don't exist simply because I won or because one person won. And that was... Um, really one of the the, the, the sad um, impacts of President Obama's victory, as incredible as his presidency was, in my view, and as important as his victory was, you had a lot of people say, well, okay, well, racism's done now, right? Like we elected a Black president, we're done. That wasn't true then, it's not true now, and it's never not going to be uh, true in, in, in my lifetime. Um, history and freedom uh, shows us, uh, as Coretta Scott King said, you know, freedom is won and rewon by by every generation. And you know, right now it's just it's just our our turn. But I'm so I'm so happy Tim was on the inside. And Tim, I don't know if you have a response to that question. No, I don't have really anything to add. I think you summed it up well. I mean, Obama he he lost his first race as well, his first uh, congressional race as well, um, and so it. It took a, a few times, but no, I, I completely agree with everything Malcolm said, and I would just sum everything up by by thanking you all again for taking the time. It seems like we have a, a decent crowd for a Friday night uh, in in London and Frankfurt, and so I just really appreciate everyone for, for watching the film, and the best thing you can do for us as we're still looking for distribution at this time is just spread the word. If you like the film... Um, post about us, you know, on social media, tell your friends about us. If you have a friend in the film and TV industry, definitely tell them. And um, yeah, your your support means a lot to us. And and I think this film will find a, a great home at some point. And when that happens, I hope you watch it again. And I, I hope that you continue to to support the film. And um, as always, just grateful to Malcolm and, and Dr. Matt for letting us tell this story because with, without them again that it, it it wouldn't work without them being so open and and into it um and so thank you all for having us oh thank you thank you so much tim it's been wonderful yeah. working with you and um i think you should be very proud of this film that you made and i'm sure you're going to make a lot more um really impactful films that will help um get the message out to we're, I think we're all working towards the same thing, which is to help us see people for who we are and human as human beings, and that you know we we need to work together. And um, I wish you all the best. And thank you so much for being with us this evening. I know you have to go now, so it's been great seeing you. I again. do. I have to pick up back to reality. I have to pick up my two year old from preschool. Life, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
here goes my weekend. But that's but, why uh, your films you work because you're showing real life. So that's great. Yeah, take care. Thank you. All right, so bye, much. bye, bye. And Marco, I just have one quick last question for sure, you, please. and this is from the Global Black Caucus. Um, and um, so, as you mentioned earlier, the 2023 Congressional Black Caucus Annual Legislative Conference is taking place in D.C. right now. And the banner themes are securing our democracy, protecting our freedoms, and uplifting our culture. So I want to ask you, given the repeated calls for President Biden not to run because some feel he's too old, further calls for him to drop Kamala Harris, the first woman of color, from the presidential ticket, coupled with persistent media reports that say, this this touches on the media piece you were just talking about, coupled with media reports that say the black electorate, particularly black male voters, have lost confidence in Biden. What made you agree to be a Biden-Harris 2024 surrogate? And how do you think we can best address these concerns and the potentially detrimental impact that such arguments could have on the outcome of the 2024 general election? So f first of all, um, I, I would say this, you know, somebody who endorsed President Biden when he ran the first time, um, I'm sort of never shocked at the amount of people who underestimate the ability for who I think is a great person and a great man for him to get big things done, not just in terms of defeating uh, Donald Trump, who is a clear and present threat to our democracy and to our fundamental freedoms, but also to achieve the historic achievements that I will tell you, frustratingly, occasionally get treated as wallpaper. When the president got past the American Rescue Plan, saving the American economy, keeping state and local governments uh, afloat, um, creating the infrastructure to get out 200 million COVID shots in the matter of months after he walked into office with under a million at that time. Um, when the president passed the infrastructure bill, which already in a state like Pennsylvania, where you know there's a real digital uh, divide because we haven't built out the infrastructure around, already we're seeing more and more people get, get connected uh, to the inter to the internet um, and have the ability to do things as basic as have their kids in school, be able to um, engage in telehealth medicine, all these different things. When the president beat the pharmaceutical companies to say they were actually going to negotiate drug prices for the first time in American history after administration after administration said they were going to do it, even Donald Trump said that we should do it, he wasn't able to do it. This president actually got it done I, I, I never hold my breath in terms of people giving him the, the credit that he deserves. But I think that the American people are going to. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember when I was told that we were going to have a red wave, um, that Democrats were just going to be wiped out at every level of government. Um, and that didn't happen. I'm old enough to remember um, when, 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 when Fook said, we weren't going to be able to appoint the most black women to the federal court system in American history, adding together every presidency combined. And so this president deserves to be reelected because he's delivering for our families. And as much as people want to treat politics as a game and a TV show, and frankly, I know folks will be honest, but there are some people in the TV media who miss Donald Trump because of what it did for their ratings. Um, there's a real reality at stake. Um, you all heard me talk about this in the film. You know, I buried my mom by the time I was 27 because she didn't have the type of access to health care that everybody deserved. I watched her ration her insulin because it was far too expensive, hundreds of dollars a vial. Now the cost of insulin is capped at $35 a month. Somebody with that record of success, do I want them to keep delivering for the American people? Hell yeah. And I think it's important for people to also look at the deep bench that he has created around him to continue to be that bridge to the next generation. I just mentioned the youngest person to lead a presidential advisory commission in American history. 
you look at the folks who he has appointed, the first black um, chief of staff of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, one of the first women to also be a chief of staff of, 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 of any of any of our branches of the military. I could spend another half an hour going through this man's list of accomplishments, and I'm not going to allow these sort of uh, warmed over narratives that aren't based in reality to guide what we should do in this ne next election. And I'll just give this last example because I know we're talking to an international audience. Many of you have done this travel back home in America, wherever you're from, back to Germany or to the UK. You know what it means to be jet lagged. And, you know, listen, when I came from, from London back, I was, I was tired. I was jet lagged. I'm young. You had the president go to G20 in India, do literally 14 hours of meetings. After those meetings, host a press conference and said, you know, I don't know about all of you, but I want to go get some sleep. And have that spun into the president's too tired to, 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 to work. Even when you had members of the press saying, oh, my God, no, he's been in meetings all day. We're tired, too. Goodbye. It just speaks to this really dangerous narrative where we are too often equating the fact that the president is the age that he is with the amount of crimes that the former guy is going to be the Republican nominee that he has. It's the same thing folks did to Hillary Clinton. Um, when they talk about her emails, her emails, her emails, as if Trump was not a clear and present danger um, to our to our democracy. And so, you know, I'm going to have none of it. We're going to go out and make the affirmative case. The president is not owed anybody's votes. He has to go and earn every vote. And people have substantive questions about his age and all those different things. And I would just reiterate what he said. Just watch him and look at that list of accomplishments. And between now and the election, he's gonna to add to that list of accomplishments. I'm leaving DC where they wanna shut down the freaking government and you have President Biden actually trying to deliver for us. I think there's a clear distinction. And at the end of the day, elections are choices. And I, to me, it's not a hard choice of whether or not I'm gonna vote for Joe Biden or any of the Republican candidates on the other side to be president. A very simple choice. And I'm going to go out and, and, you know, thoroughly make that case to my constituents all across Pennsylvania and to the country. Great. Thank you so much, Malcolm. That is a very inspiring note to end on as we look ahead. And um, we also kept everyone late. So thank you all for sticking around. Malcolm, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much. Talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you. Bye. And as for everybody else, uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to the organizers in the UK and in Germany. We could not have done this without the DA UK Film Committee, as well as, as Frankfurt Chapter's leadership. Thank you so much. Um, I know a lot of you are probably energized today after, um, after this great film, this great Q&A. So we will be sending out some more information uh, in the next few days, an email about how you can get involved with this election as well as the 2024 election. But I understand quite a few of you are off to the pub now. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming.